Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences and the fourth of our Centennial Research and Training Colloquia series this year. I'm Elizabeth Tracy, Professor and Associate Dean for Research and Training at the school. We are, are a diverse group gathered here today. We're masters and doctoral level students, alumni, faculty, field instructors, research staff and associates, community practitioners and administrators. We represent the social work profession and the Mandel School well. A warm welcome also to the many viewers connecting remotely through our live streaming. I also want to recognize David Beagle, who's chair of the doctoral program. He's here today. And we have Kathy Farkas and Denise Gibson, who are sitting next to each other. And they are co-chairs of the Centennial Committee. A few logistics, restrooms to the right. Uh, students, please sign up for PD hours. If you've signed up for Social Work CEUs, your certificate will be in the lobby at the end of the session today. Some well-deserved thank yous to Helen Menke, Ina Brand, Maria Sharon, Tracy Bradman, and Noor Hennessy, who you'll meet shortly, Associate Dean for Institutional Advancement. All of these people have helped with this series. This colloquia is co-sponsored by the Office of Research Administration and the doctoral program at the Mandel School. You will find uh, at the registration area the next two colloquia that are happening this year, two two of them in April. We're pleased and proud to note that all speakers in this series are graduates of the Mandel School. And today we're happy to have here with us Charles Emlett, who earned his PhD from the Mandel School in 1998, and Mary McNamara, who earned her MSSA degree in 2003. Each speaker will present for about 50 minutes, and there will be time at the end of each speaker's talk for questions. We'll be using a microphone for this, so please wait until Nora runs the microphone to you before you ask your question so that we can all hear it. For those connecting remotely, you can email questions to mandelschool at case.edu during the question and answer time. And when we're done with the presentations, we'll invite everyone to the lounge area for a reception, a more informal time to talk with their speakers. Our first speaker, Dr. Emlett, is Professor of Social Work at the University of Washington Tacoma Social Work, Adjunct Associate Professor with the University of Washington School of Social Work in Seattle, and Affiliate Faculty with the UW University of Washington Center for AIDS Research. He holds a gubernatorial appointment to the Governor's Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. He was a Hartford Geriatric Social Work Faculty Scholar. He received his MSW from California State University, Fresno, and a PhD in social welfare from the Mandel School. His talk today is Aging Successfully with HIV. Our second speaker, Ms. McNamara, was a social worker in rural eastern Kentucky for seven years working with homeless families and victims of domestic violence before returning to her hometown of Cleveland. She currently is an administrator manager with the City of Cleveland Department of Aging. Prior to this position, she worked as a program director at Fairhill Partners, a multi-tenant campus dedicated to successful aging. Mary also volunteers with the Imani Children's Foundation in Kenya with new refugees who've relocated to Cleveland as well. She has an MSSA degree from the Mandel School with a specialization in aging. And her talk today is Making Cleveland an Age-Friendly City. So please join me now in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Charles Emlett. Good, okay. Well, that helps, doesn't it? <clears throat> well, I really appreciate being asked to come and talk to you today. It's an absolute delight to come back. Uh, I haven't been back to Cleveland for some time, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation and to tell you a little bit about the stuff I've been doing for a while. Um, <clears throat> So my topic today is about aging successfully with HIV disease and lessons from long-term survivors. And for so the students in the audience, uh, you might be interested to know that this was uh, somewhat 
not the successful aging part, but the aging with HIV part was really the subject of my doctoral dissertation. So apparently I'm like a dog with a bone. I find something I like. I don't let go for 20 years or so. Um, and the interesting thing is it continues to change enough that uh, it stays interesting and doesn't get boring and it's just really uh, has been a, a topic that has lasted really pretty much my entire career. Oops. Okay. Just a couple of acknowledgments. The research that I'm going to share with you today was supported by uh, grants from Fulbright Canada and the University of Washington Tacoma. I had the fortune of being a Fulbright scholar and visiting research chair at McMaster University in 2012 and 13. I was also visiting faculty at the University of Toronto School of Social Work. But I also want to thank the 30 people that I'm going to tell you about today who graciously shared their lives and their stories with me. Uh, I came out of, uh, as sometimes we talk about researchers being taking the helicopter approach where they sort of drop into a community and do some stuff and then, and then leave. And it's the antithesis to uh, community participatory research. And I, I hope I didn't do that, but I certainly was a stranger and I was an American. And these folks opened their homes and their doors and told me their stories. And so I think it's just really important that I thank them. So for this slide, we can see just how exactly, how dramatically the number of older adults living with HIV is uh, growing in the United States. And in 2002, the CDC estimated that there were about uh, 312,000 adults 50 and over living in the United States with HIV. Three years later, the number had grown to almost 400,000. So that's, that's, quite, that's pretty substantial. There's one projection that was provided at a testimony a couple of years ago to the Senate Special Committee on Aging that by the year 2020, uh, it, the number of older adults living with HIV in the United States could be as high as 70% of everyone living with HIV. So that's uh, quite a uh, stark reality. While the number of new infections among older adults have dropped, in 2013 there were still about 7,000 new cases of HIV in the United States in people over 50. So this rapid increase in the number of older adults with HIV is a confluence of new infections and those doing what some call aging in with HIV. In other words, they have been infected for a long time but are living long enough to grow old. When I came here as a doctoral student, it was 1994, and antiretroviral therapy wasn't very effective. And the main way you were an older person with HIV is you were infected as an older person because uh, you didn't live that long. And so much not the case now. And so we're able to watch people age and, and the challenges but the opportunities that exist. A couple of years ago, I was teaching an undergraduate class in HIV and I was trying to explain kind of how this works with, to, to students and I said, ah, well, let's look at it this way. That back door that's got that's the glass door are new infections and the door over here on the side is mortality. And early in the epidemic, there were a lot of people coming in the glass door, but there were a lot of people going out the side door. And so the room stayed relatively small. What happens now is there's a lot of people coming in the glass door, very few people going out the, the side door, and so the room gets full. Right? And as the room gets full, the longer you stay in the room, the older you get. And so we have lots of people that are growing old in all kinds of different ways with a disease that not so long ago was a death sentence. I think the fact that there are 7,000 new diagnoses, diagnoses of HIV disease points to the fact that we continue to need targeted education and prevention efforts for older adults. It's really key. So when I look at HIV prevention material, as a, a, co a colleague of mine long ago said, look for the wrinkled face. 
we know that in order for education materials to be effective, you have to be able to relate to those materials. If you don't see a wrinkled face on the promotion material and you're an older person, why would you think that would be relevant to you? So something to, to consider. And unfortunately, that's a mantra that we've been repeating for a, a pretty long time. So while older adults with HIV are often seen by a lot of folks as kind of a homogeneous group, this slide is designed to show you just the complexity of subpopulations not taking into account gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, or transmission risk. So those who were diagnosed before the advent of antiretroviral therapy, roughly around 1996, had qualitatively different experiences than those diagnosed or, uh, after 1996, with an increased likelihood of, of what they themselves called death sentences, loss of multiple friends and partners, and we'll hear some quotes a little bit later about th those, those experiences. But older adults recently diagnosed may be new infe newly infected, that's possible, or they can fall into a category of what the CDC calls a late diagnosis. And that's where someone has been infected for a long time, they're unaware of it, they come in usually pretty symptomatic, and they learn that they're HIV infected, but they also learn that they have AIDS at the same time. And the reason that happens is low clinical, low clinical suspicion on the part of providers and older adults who engage in behavior that they don't believe put themselves at risk. And uh, what happens then is they go along and they have maybe some flu-like symptoms and they write it off as the flu and then they have some other symptoms and they write it off as aging and guess what? They, something happens, they end up in the hospital oftentimes, and they learn that they have advanced HIV disease. Of course, when that happens, people have more serious symptoms, increased complexity, uh, the treatment becomes more immediate, and issues around mortality are, are much higher. So we have this rapid growth of older adults living with HIV. We have the potential for a normal life expectancy with uh, a low containable viral load, good medical care. Th there's evidence that people can live as long as anyone else these days. So a, a few years ago, the NIH convened what they call the HIV and Aging Working Group. And, they want, and, and that working group said that we really need to identify successful aging as a research priority. That we needed to enhance our understanding of the social behavioral influences on aging with HIV and to enhance positive outcomes. So what's happened for a long time is although we've been looking at aging and HIV, it tends to be very uh, deficit focused. So we're looking at accelerated aging and we're looking at issues of comorbidity and we're looking at issues of stigma and discrimination, which by the way still exist uh, to a much higher extent than should. Uh, we're looking at depression, we're looking at all those kinds of things, but what about successful aging? What about that flip side of it? So this working group said a research priority needs to be studies that examine the mechanisms of successful aging among older adults living with HIV. And they encouraged that we translate these research findings for those not aging well. So the idea is if we can find out how people age well, age successfully with HIV, and these things occur somewhat organically, Right, through just normal mechanisms. If we can really identify that and understand it, the possibility exists then of taking that and organizing it in a way that could work toward the development of interventions. So the NIH Aging and HIV Working Group says, ah, we have to be looking at a number of things. We need to look at a positive psychology. We need to look at issues of resilience, mindfulness, social support, and a number of other factors. So the study I'm going to tell you about today, the research question was, what personal characteristics and resources are seen as contributing to successful aging with HIV disease 
among adults 50 and over. The study used uh, qualitative methods through a modified grounded theory approach to better understand the lived experiences of people aging with HIV. The approach was informed by the late life resilience model developed by Smith and Hayslip, suggesting that intrapersonal characteristics, interpersonal connections, and environmental support can assist with a process of resilience among older adults. And this model was not specific to those with HIV disease. It was published in the, so there's an annual publication that Springer does. I think it's called the um, uh, Annual Review of Gerontology and Geriatrics. Does it sound about right? Anyway, um, it was in, I believe, the 2012 issue. And so this resilient model wasn't about HIV disease, but it was about resilience in old age. It seemed applicable here, so we adopted it as a, as a uh, model and a framework for this study. We conducted in-depth interviews with adults 50 and over living in, uh, with HIV in Ontario, Canada, who self-identified as aging well with HIV. The reason we chose, how did I end up doing this in uh, Ontario, Canada, I was on sabbatical and I was able to obtain a Fulbright. And we know that you can't, do, you can't get a Fulbright award and do it in your own country. So I had some relationships developed in Ontario it would give me an entree into the world of uh, HIV service delivery and some colleagues at the University of Toronto. So I was able to go there and establish that and get a fair amount of work done in a relatively short period of time. So we recruited folks through AIDS service organizations, clinics, HIV service providers in Toronto and Hamilton. Hamilton is where McMaster University is, and that was where part of my time was spent. All the interviews were conducted between February and May of 2013, so I did 30 interviews in those few months, so I was fairly busy. Um, the study procedures were approved by McMaster University, their research ethics board. In order to be part of the study, adults had to be, we had to be 50 and over. And, you know, that's an interesting thing. I don't even think you can get a Denny's discount at 50. So why 50? Well, it was, a, it was a standard that was set a really long time ago by the CDC. And there was a point in the surveillance reports where the oldest they, um, tracked, they would say 40 to 49, and then everything else was over. And those were the re really early days of surveillance reports. So somehow that idea of 50 and over sort of got tagged early in the epidemic, and that's become kind of a standard practice of what an older adult with HIV is defined as. Sometimes you see it drop a little bit as low as 45, uh, sometimes you know, 55 or 60, but 50 seems to be the somewhat generally accepted um, uh, notion. So they had to be 50 and over. That in itself is interesting. I'll tell you a story in a minute. They had to be HIV positive. They had to perceive themselves as aging well with HIV. That was self-defined. So in the spirit of qualitative research, I would ask them, do you think you're aging well with HIV? And if they said yes, then uh, we, they were in the study. Um, they needed to live in Ontario, Canada, primarily uh, Toronto or Hamilton, and they were given an incentive of $25 Canadian for their time and, and uh, their, their efforts. So uh, there was initial phone screening uh, where folks were asked to call me, and uh, they, we, I did a, a screening interview. What I found it was really interesting was I got quite a few phone calls and I would go through and I would say, I have HIV disease, yes, you're aging well, yes, you live in Toronto or Hamilton, yes, you're 50 years and over, mm, almost. Well, what's almost? Well, I'm almost 50. Well, how most almost how 50 are you? Well, I'll be 50 pretty soon. When? <laughs> 
in about three years. One person said, you know, in about three years, I'm going, sorry. You know, and I, and I said, well, you know, if you're going to be 50 before I leave, we can probably talk about this. But no, you can't be 49 and be in my study. I was surprised, or 47, I was surprised how many people wanted to fudge that. I don't know if it was a $25 gift card or not, but, but I really had to ask, you know, are you 50? Are you really 50? So I would do this phone screening with them. I met them uh, in person after that. There was a doctoral student at McMaster that conducted some of these uh, interviews, particularly the ones that occurred in Hamilton. Uh, we obtained informed consent, and then we did in-depth, face-to-face, semi-structured interviews uh, with each person. They were conducted in the person's home or in an HIV facility well known to the community or at a university office. We tried to keep away from noisy public places. There's, there's a story here, that, uh, particularly when we're talking about qualitative research that I think is worth telling. And this whole idea of history and context is really important. I was, I was interviewing quite a few people at Casey House, which is the first AIDS hospice in North America. It's very, very well known in Toronto and highly respected. And they gave me space to interview there. They gave me office space and it was, they were so welcoming and wonderful. But one day I was interviewing a man and he was sort of looking around and I said, um, uh, are you familiar with, he, or he, he said to me, I haven't been here for a really long time. And I said, oh, well, tell me about the last time you were here. And he said, um, I was here in 19, something like 1996. Uh, my partner died here. And all of a sudden, I realized that some place that on one hand, well known to the community, well established, good rapport, had this other side. And this other side was a long history of uh, taking in people and helping them die from HIV disease. And so, you know, it's important to sort of see the whole, both sides of things, that something can be really positive and have, a, have another side to it as well. We used nine open-ended questions with additional probes, and the interviews lasted somewhere, most of them between 45 and 90 minutes. And each interview was digitally recorded and then professionally transcribed. The transcripts were read by a team of four people, myself, a colleague at the University of Toronto, and two students. Uh, the analysis process began with some open coding, looking for themes and phrases that were associated with the sensitizing concept of aging successfully. We looked for higher order concepts identified uh, the, through consensus of the team and used NVivo 10 to assist in the analysis and the identifying of uh, key concepts. And we continue the examination and refining the concepts uh, still. We have lots and lots of data and we're currently writing a paper specifically on issues around spirituality and religion in this, in this population. This gives you some background characteristics on the sample. Uh, folks ranged in age from 50 to 73. They averaged about 58. Uh, two-thirds were male. Two-thirds were white, Caucasian, Canadians. About 60% were gay men. Uh, time since diagnosis, 4 to 31 years with an average of almost 20 years, 18. It worked out really well. This wasn't intentional, but just slightly over half the people we recruited were diagnosed before the advent of highly active retroviral therapy. And so their experiences were markedly different than those diagnosed later. So one of the papers we're planning on is to look at the difference in experiences and life and health and trajectory from those two groups. And it worked out really nice that it came out about half and half. Uh, about 60% lived alone. Not uncommon that we find older adults with HIV are more socially isolated and uh, are more likely to live alone than their younger counterparts. The 
So our qualitative findings revealed some important juxtapositions. For example, resilience by definition occurs as a reaction or adjustment to adversity. Without adversity, there's no resilience. And we were talking about that at dinner last night. And I was saying, well, without adversity, you're not resilient, you're, hmm. And I paused and Kathy Farkas said, lucky. And that's exactly the word I thought of, you're lucky. If, 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 if you did not have those experiences of adversity, you're not resilient because resilient by definition is the bouncing back from something, right? Societal reactions to illness can come in the form of social support from one's family and community or rejection and stigma. And we think stigma, HIV stigma, is long gone, but I have to tell you in talking to these folks, I would say that's just absolutely not true. I interviewed a woman who uh, was in her 50s and she was from Burma. And she told me how she was, had been completely rejected by the Burmese community in Toronto once they found out about her diagnosis. They essentially won't have anything to do with her. This, is, this was two years ago. So um, that, that issue of stigma and discrimination uh, is certainly lessened than it was, but it's not gone. One's environment can be supportive with resources and care and, or add to the isolation and serve as a barrier to good care. So that environmental piece ends up being really important. In the following slides, I'm going to present some of the major themes that emerged from this analysis, including resilience and challenges, social support, and the importance of an environmental context. So I mentioned earlier resilience was a major theme that emerged, but in the context of significant trauma and challenges from one's past history and experiences. Due to the limitations of time, I can only provide limited examples of these experiences through a project that yielded 700 pages of transcripts. The stack is about like that. So um, it'll be a while. We'll be able to get some interesting stuff out, but um, it might take a little bit of time. It might surpass my retirement. Um, so people talked about challenges of substance use, current and, and past substance use. A number of people talked about just incredible stories of sexual trauma. And you'll hear a quote from one of the women that, um, I had been a social worker for a really long time. And when she told me her story, I was just about speechless. So uh, some, some issues of sexual trauma. Suicide risk and attempts. And for some of these folks, the suicide uh, attempts were HIV related and for some of them not. Nevertheless, that's that, that um, suicidality and that kind of this, just having no place to go and giving up was a theme that occurred. Uh, loss of peers and a death sentence. Strategies included self-care, spirituality, identity and mastery, and the importance of generativity. So some challenges. What I'm going to try to do is to provide you some quotes that tie back to those items that we just, just, I just listed a moment ago. So one man said, we're so lucky to still be here, be kicking, and especially me, because I tried to commit suicide four times over the HIV. Think about that for a moment. Four times, four suicide attempts related to being HIV positive and how difficult that must have been for him. This, is, this next quote is the one I was telling you about. And the woman was, uh, had immigrated uh, to the United States and then um, Canada from West Africa. And I don't know what stunned me more, her story or the matter-of-fact way in which she told it to me. So we were talking about this, and she says, One day I go into the city to do something, and there were four young men who robbed me and beat me all night, who raped me all night. I think that's where I got HIV from. How do you even respond to that? What can you say that doesn't sound trite? 
and and even after all of these years talking to lots of people about lots of things it really it really challenged me for for a moment in terms of this idea of survival and death sentence and and guilt this one man said 1988 it was one of the worst my friends were dying by the dozens. I was still sexually active, so it was this menacing situation of, okay, I'm still doing it, but I don't want to. I know it could kill me. So his experience would be very different in 1988 than someone who was sexually active and um, uh, diagnosed in, say, you know, 1999 or, I mean, yeah, 1999 or, or 2000 or 2003. These quotes have been chosen specifically to exemplify the concepts related to resilience of self-care, the use of mindfulness practice, which is sometimes tied to spirituality, and the idea of identity, uh, identity as strategies for resilience. So one person said, regular exercise, go to therapy with your issues. Good advice for all of us, right? Go to therapy with your issues, promote your friendships, be part of a collective, find yourself something you're passionate about, do it. So this person was telling me about how important self-care was in the context of resilience and aging well. There's a phenomenon called lipodystrophy, and that occurs sometimes when uh, it's a side effect of HIV meds where the distribution of fat moves around, and it causes a, a significant amount for some people of uh, body image changes and deformity and it can be quite, uh, quite devastating. So this man says to me, the lipodystrophy caused me tremendous grief, and it was through mindfulness meditation that I was able to find the relief that I was seeking just to be able to be in the world. One of the things that I enjoy about qualitative research is its flexibility. We didn't start by asking people about religion and spirituality. And what we found was in the first few interviews, everybody wanted to talk about it. It's like, wow, well maybe we ought to ask about it then. So then we begin to more intentionally ask people about their, uh, their religion and spirituality and how that fit into their whole, their whole aging well scheme. In terms of identity, there was this issue of identity, and, and, and uh, we, we ended up terming this HIZ, HIV centrality, or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's HIV not centrality. But uh, they, uh, one man said, um, I accept my HIV. I don't see it as a black mark on me because I consider myself more than my HIV. And so putting that into context, and the folks talked about how it was a relatively small part of their life. One woman said to me, actually, that she forgets. She forgets she's HIV positive and something reminds her, and she goes, oh, oh, yeah. So that seemed, that identity piece was really important. Sorry. Okay. Social support. Social support was a very important element of successful aging, and you see it in the literature around lots of things. We're doing some, I'm involved in a project where we're looking at um, quality of life and health disparities in uh, uh, LGBT older adults. Social support is huge, even though lifetime victimization and discrimination ends up being uh, a big part of it and stigma, but this social support is really quite a mitigating factor. So social support was important with some interesting caveats. And many people talked about their past and current histories of drug use, sexual behavior that was detrimental. So while they clearly recognize the importance of interpersonal connection and support, they also realize that quality was more important than quantity. And some engaged with what we ended up calling pruning, representing the idea of removing dead and unbeneficial wood in order to facilitate renewal. So people are telling me their stories about this, and uh, what you don't know about me is that I, I'm an old farm boy, and I grew up on a farm, and we raised primarily uh, grapes. 
so I grew up on a in, in, in vineyards. And every fall, we would go out and there would be these long two, three, four foot canes on the grapevines and we would prune them. And so you take them back to the essence through a, to a really small nub and that would facilitate growth the following year so you had a good healthy plant. And so when people are telling me these stories, one day this light bulb went on and I went, oh my God, they're pruning. Ah, they're pruning their social network. How interesting. So we juxtapose this idea of social support into two ideas that we called letting in the positive and then pruning. So one person said, the only people that I have contact with anymore are my friends that are positive. Now in this instance, it's not a double play on words and they don't mean their HIV status. They mean their attitude. The only contact I have are my friends that are positive. Another person said, when you get older, it's now the quality of the friendships. It's the quality of the people you're interacting with. In a way, if we think about the uh, selective optimization compensation theory of, of aging, it sort of falls into that, right? That there's some selectivity that occurs here. On the other side, people said, quantity, one man said, quantity is not high at all, quality. Because I expect a lot. That means choosing the right people that you associate with. So for some folks, they were, they were refusing to deal with folks that maybe were still engaged in drug using behavior or things that would sort of pull them into lifestyle that was not, not good for them, not aging, not helping them age well. And they were willing to make those changes and make those cuts. This last quote says, <laughs> it, it was quite something. He said, some people just suck energy and, I, and I've been weeding them out. So he talked about, he talked a lot about that. He talked about, you know, very carefully, not only looking at his past, his sort of, you know, social network, but, but who he's associating with now and whether to bring those people in his life or not. And he was very, very critical in his analysis of that. So the moral of the story is, you know, a lot of times when we think about social networks, we kind of get caught up and, and, and believe sometime is bigger, bigger is better, right? Because it's more, there's more diversity or there's more people you can draw on. And these folks are going, uh, 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 it's about quality. It's about quality. One's environment was also important. It was an important consideration in aging well with HIV, including the living environment, their HIV support community, benefits from governmental sources, and the importance of reciprocity and generativity. Participants noted issues of financial limitations based on disability eligibility criteria and ongoing social stigma as impediments to aging well. So in terms of supportive influences, they spoke about the HIV community, including AIDS service organizations and how important those were. I think it's important to note that while folks talked a lot about that HIV network of services, very few talked about aging services or what, what in the United States we would call the aging network. That that piece didn't seem to be organically nearly as supportive. And so they, their, their connection, their volunteerism, that sense of community seemed to be much more around HIV and those resources than anything related to growing older. Reciprocity was really, really important. People would talk about volunteering, but not just, you know, a couple hours a week. Folks were volunteering for two and three uh, different HIV organizations, and it was really important to them. One man talked about the importance of giving back. He said to me, when it comes to HIV, I'm an elder. I'm an elder. And so he spent his time mentoring young HIV infected men and what to expect and how to, what he found out through his lived experience and how he might be able to help them live a better life. 
So that idea of reciprocity was really important. Governmental support, benefits, housing, clearly important in, in terms of being supportive. But there were impediments. Financial precariousness, although one of the interesting things that I learned about the Canadian system is as soon as you test HIV positive, you're considered disabled. Where here, it's much more of a functional uh, definition, right? And do you meet Social Security Administration's criteria for disability in, in more of a functional sense? So I was, um, I was interviewing people, and, and at first I didn't know this. I was kind of scratching my head because I'm interviewing people thinking, hmm, you're healthier than I am. I'm not quite sure I'm understanding this. And then someone said, ah, the issue is that as soon as you're HIV positive, you're eligible for disability. But as it's true here with Medicaid, those, those disability benefits come with some restrictions around income and work. They also differ by province. And so one man talked to me about his family being out in Nova Scotia. And he said, what I would really like to do is I'd like to move back to Halifax and I'd like to be around my family. The problem is when I compare my disability benefits between Nova Scotia and Ontario, they're so much better here. He, he essentially said, I'm locked in, right? I'm kind of, I'm locked into this fairly decent disability package and I'm not as free geographically as I, I would like to be because of that. And another, of course, context, negative context was the, the continued existence of a stigmatizing society. In terms of a supportive environment, uh, one person said, I had the food bank for a little while. Now with a full pension, I've got enough money to buy food, so I'm all right. I mean, think about that for a minute. So that's the threshold. I have enough money to buy food. And we think about you know, our lifestyle and we go to Starbucks and we drop three bucks for a latte and we don't blink an eye. And he says, I'm doing all right. I have enough money to buy food. Another person said, so how do you give, I, I actually really love this quote. How do you give back? How do you say thank you for a good, for good health care? Well, you contribute as much as you can to the social structure. And this was a man who volunteered at multiple organizations, spent a lot, of a lot of his time giving back. In terms of impeding factors, one said, all my life I was so independent and now I depend on insurance and this and that and subsidized housing and everything you know, I'm not free. And finally, when people know that you're HIV, oh, the whole world, then you feel like people are staring at you. That alone can keep you up at night. So the study examined experiences of aging well with HIV from the perspective of 30 over older adults. It adds to our knowledge of what contributes to successful aging. When we look at the original framework of successful aging by Rowan Kahn, you know, there wasn't a lot of discussion about what happens as you're dealing with disability and, and functional impairment. And here's a group of people who are, and you know, you have to remember that many of them didn't just have HIV, they had a lot of the chronic conditions, so, uh, comorbid conditions that we would expect with normal aging. And yet they're, they're aging quite successfully by their own definition. So we're able to add to the knowledge and understand a little bit about how we can approach this from folks living with a stigmatizing and difficult and at one time deadly disease. The major themes that emerge organically, really, paralleled those identified by the HIV, by the NIH HIV and Aging Working Group, including resilience, social support, self-efficacy, mastery, spirituality, and mindfulness. 
And if we go back and we look at that initial report, a lot of those, a lot of those issues were mentioned in that in that kind of call for research priorities. But we didn't. These 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 themes really emanated organically. It weren't. It, we weren't sort of running around searching for them. Whoops. It reinforces the intersection of interpersonal, interpersonal, and environmental influences suggested by the late life resilience model. And so that model was really the kind of value and utility of that model, I think, was reinforced through this study. We've been able, we've identified components contributing to su successful aging that could be used to create potential interventions. So helping people look and reconfigure their social network, uh, thinking very deeply about their identity and, and possibly can we find ways to help them increase self-efficacy and mastery. Those are all potential interventions that we can begin to look at. So implications. There was a resolve on the part of these 30 people to fight HIV and to live as long and healthy as possible. And that was really central to their experience. They just kind of had this overall attitude of, it's not going to get me. It's not going to get me. Practitioners can work to enhance self-care strategies for, uh, for self-efficacy. So as we're working with people that are um, living with HIV disease, how can we help them enhance their sense of mastery and self-efficacy? We need to acknowledge the importance of spirituality in its many forms. So when we looked at the people and talked to folks about this, it ranged everything from very standard religious practice, going to church on Sunday, some prayer, something that would, would feel very normal to us kind of on a on a day-to-day -day basis, to people who had very, very different views of spirituality. I had a couple of people we interviewed that were Aboriginal and their sense of spirituality was markedly different. Uh, people who brought in 12-step histories and the idea of a higher power. So that peace is important and not getting locked into what it's supposed to look like is important for the practitioner. So you, you know, I, I teach a class, I'm currently teaching it on spirituality and social work practice. And, and how do people define that for themselves, right? And so it's, so it's important to hear them and it's important to ask. Successful aging included the intentional formulation of social networks that promote self-fortification, resilience, and positivity. So looking at that and, and looking at people's social networks and helping them even think about and configure what is working for them, what's good for them, what's not. You know, we can't assume that, that uh, uh, everything is good for them. And that aging well includes that in, intrapersonal peace of identity, self-efficacy, the interpersonal piece of social support, and the positive and negative influence of environmental context. I had a good time telling you about this. There's a lot of stuff there. It's going to take me a long, long time to get through it. Uh, but we're working on it. And uh, Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for asking me here. Yeah. Questions, comments? Hi. I was just wondering about what proportion of the people whom you approach said that they were aging successfully. In other words, since the study had those who were aging successfully by their own self-definition, right. uh, is that the majority, is that half and half, or how was that distributed? And uh, might you have any ideas that maybe some of the people in your sample were aging more successfully than others? Okay, thank you. So yeah, what proportion? So we wanted to get this idea of what it meant to age successfully. So that was one of the inclusion criteria. And people, of course, what was interesting was they range from being very, very healthy to being wheelchair bound. 
And so that idea of successful aging seemed to transcend, say, things like functional limitations, right? Um, but they all felt that they had a good handle on their HIV disease. And if I would have had more time and maybe more resources, it would have been probably good to have some negative case examples and to perhaps interview a few people who said they weren't aging well with HIV disease and kind of see how that, how that juxtaposition. But by and large, everybody felt in some way or another that they were. And one of their specific questions was, was to tell us, right, how, how that comes about for you. And so those, uh, you know, those stories range dramatically, but, but many of them were reflected in these, these kind of emerging themes. Yeah. A lot of very interesting uh, study, uh, Charlie. I was particularly struck when you said that there was uh, little contact with the formal service network. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's a strong aging service network in Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, could you say a little more about that? Why? Was it more the focus of the study was more on the informal network? Or what would you say was the reason why there didn't seem to be a connection there? So uh, I think what happens is we have this intersection of two processes that are both uh, in, in society stigmatizing. So we have this. Uh, inherent ageism that exists in our society and we have pretty substantial HIV stigma. And when people decide which network to go um, to for services, they're almost by default also choosing which characteristic they have they're going to have to deal with in a stigmatizing way. So do I want to go to an aging network that is probably very HIV insensitive? Um, and I did a study a few years ago. I looked at, I, I surveyed all the area agencies on aging in Washington state. And I asked them about their preparedness to deal with this population. And by and far, they said, no, we're not ready. And we don't understand it and we don't have enough information. If you go to the HIV network, you're not fighting that HIV stigma battle. And, and, and there's a lot of camaraderie, I think, because everybody has that thread that runs through their lives. What they may have to deal with is ageism. And my sense is, both from talking to these folks and, and folks in the United States, that on balance they say, I'm better off going to the HIV network they understand me more and they understand the complexity of my life and I'll deal with the ageism rather than going somewhere where they uh, might, they, there might be more sensitivity to their age and less understanding about their HIV. The other piece though that might very well factor into it, Terry, is, a, is a, a number of these folks, often in these studies, a lot of them are between age 50 and 60. And so I'm not sure about Canadian criteria, but of course here, someone in their you know, 50s wouldn't necessarily be seeking out older American Act kinds of programs. That's my guess, but um, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Charlie. Can you say a few words more about things you observed about how either the social support networks or the larger environment would either help build that sense of self-efficacy and mastery or cut it down, hmm. impede it? Right, right. The th interesting thing about your question, Aloan, is I think that it has a lot to do, as I kind of reflect on it, as the way people experience, almost experience benefits. Because so for many people that I talk to, as part of their delivery system, many of them had subsidized housing. And many of them lived in HIV specific subsidized housing. And so in some ways they were, um, they had a really nice support network from that system. And it seemed to me that for some people, 
that would they, that was seen as really positive, right? So that gives me some degrees of freedom to to work. I don't have to worry about housing. I don't have to worry about you know taking up a huge part of rent, taking up this huge part of my income, and that was a good thing. For other people, they saw that as as that man, one man said, "I'm not free. I'm not. I'm I'm tied to this network, and I don't want to be." Um, and I think in those instances, they felt there, there probably was, they probably did not feel a strong sense of mastery in that, how do I get out of this? You know, there's, I'm almost locked into these benefits. Um, there was a difference also around the two locations. So when I think of Toronto, correctly or not, I somewhat parallel it to New York City. And so there was, there was a lot more resources in that area, especially in that area of downtown Toronto, than there was in Hamilton. And so in Hamilton, which was quite a ways away, there was only one aid service organization. Uh, it didn't function all that well. And I think people were less assured of what the system is going to do for them. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but OK, great. Time this out, okay? Perfect. Great. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Question yeah, yeah. Relate so much to this is, but how did a uh, farm boy from the vineyards of California end up at Case Western Reserve University? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> um, but uh, we were talking yesterday, and someone mentioned uh, adjuncts and, and using a lot of adjuncts. So when I started uh, college, I, w I was an ag major, and I was taking classes in soil analysis and and uh, you know uh, farm math and things like that. But my heart wasn't in it, and I really didn't you know it didn't feel right. And I signed up for a class. I still don't understand why. Called something like Introduction to Social Work. And there was this guy, and he had he was in the in the early 70s, and he had the, the perfect little goatee, and he was a psychiatric social worker, and he cared about people. And he worked with people that were you know seriously mentally ill, and uh, and he was kind. And most of the men that I uh, grew up around were tough farmers, and most of them were World War II vets. And even the kind ones were hard. You know, the really nice ones were hard and the not nice ones were, you know, off the charts. So here's this guy and he's got this goatee and he talks about and he cares about people. And so I took a class from him. I liked him. I took another class from him, liked him as much, changed my major, <laughs> never looked back. So uh, that's, that's my best guess. That or karma. I'm not sure which. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Join me in welcoming our second speaker, Mary McNamara. Thank you, Dr. Tracy. And thank you, Dr. Emlett. It was, I heard some of those stories last night, but I really enjoyed the whole story today. So um, happy 100th birthday, MSAS. It feels like aging well is the right topic for all of us today, right? Um, so I'm delighted to be at MSAS um, today to share about our collective work around making Cleveland more age friendly. And I started as a geriatric social worker when I was 30 years old, and so, I really wanted to know the stories of people who had been aging over 60, although we're all aging. I really wanted um, to know those stories, and I just wanted to share a few of them with you as I start, because they've been my teachers. In the upper left-hand corner is my father, who's 81 now. My father has rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, a form of arthritis many people have as they age. and. Um, he can't play and exercise in the same way as he's gotten older, but he still wants to. And in a pool, he is free of pain. And so this is a picture taken at Cudell Recreation Center with two children who are being raised by their grandmother. And at this camp that my father volunteered at, he was free of his limitations, and he found purpose and joy. 
In the upper right-hand corner is my mentor in life, a wise woman from Alabama who was an avid reader, a reader, an English teacher. And as she got older, she found it was harder and harder to read with artificial light. So on this day, about 10 years ago, we pulled our chairs outside in Alabama and we read outside. And she, for me, was a reminder of the ways that people deal with the changes and challenges of aging head on and with incredible courage. In the lower left are some of my relatives on the west coast of Ireland, on the island of Ackle. And they go to the pub every night, right? That's the center of rural community. And as they got older, these two gentlemen started coming to the pub less and less. And it was really the community that began noticing that they weren't coming around more and missed them. And the community responded with an informal transportation system to help them get to the pub and get home every night so they could remain part of the community. We know the community ages together. And in the lower right-hand corner, um, I've, I've had the good fortune to go to Kenya every year for the last 10 years around some work with a baby orphanage. I snapped this photo back in 2008 in Mombasa. It was of a grandmother caring for her granddaughter. In the face of the AIDS crisis, she was the face to me of resilience and strength. So those are my personal teachers about aging and my professional teachers. We know the person in the upper left-hand corner Dr. Hockenstad, I've shared with many people that I wouldn't be in this field of aging without him. Um, I really believe that. I had gone to a concentration fair in 2001 here at MSAS. And I had been, as uh, Dr. Tracy said, been in more working with families and victims of domestic violence. And so on that day as a master's student, when you declare your concentration, the line for school social work and children, youth, and families and uh, mental health, it was all so long. And uh, there was no one at Dr. Hockenstead's table <laughs> under aging. And I felt a little bad for him. He looked nice enough. <laughs> and so I went up and I introduced myself and he said something. I said to him, I know I don't want to work in the field of aging because I have a very queasy stomach and I don't want to be in a hospital or a nursing home. And he said something that changed my path. He said, at any given time, only 5% of older adults are in an institution. The other 95% are living on your block, worshiping where you do, shopping where you do. That clicked with me. He might have also said something about job security, but <laughs> at that moment, it changed my path. In the upper right-hand corner is a Phil, a guy you might see walking around Cleveland. Um, every Saturday, he walks 10 miles around Cleveland. This is him at our Cleveland Senior Walk. More than 1,000 seniors join us every fall for a walk downtown to sort of bust the myths of aging. Phil is a community volunteer. He's a regular at the YMCA every day. He's an activist. And when I ask him, um, you know, Phil, tell me a little bit more about how you come up with this rhythm. He says, you know, I may not be able to do it tomorrow, but I can do it today, and so I'm going to do it today. Right? So one day at a time, 87 years old. And Phyllis in the bottom right, I met her at the National Senior Games that Cleveland hosted. She was finishing a triathlon in this picture, 87 years old. She had taken the Greyhound bus up from Florida and was staying in the college dorms. She took up exercise at this level after her husband died. She took this up in her 70s. She told me that her family gets really worried about her, her children. She, they get worried that she's going to get hurt. And she said as I jogged alongside her that day, I tell them I could get hurt just sitting on the couch. All right? So she was a teacher to me. In the lower left, Judge Capers at 103 and her sister Annie. I picked them up and took them to Mayor Jackson's State of the City address last month. They help me realize how important it is not just to age in place, but to age in our community with access to health care, to entertainment, to stimulating conversation. And in the middle, a grandmother, Mrs. M, who was raising her grandchildren. I met her as an intern while I was at MSAS here. It was my placement. She was the person who taught me that retirement wasn't really always about being a snowbird or playing bingo or having free time. It was sometimes filled with hard work. She didn't expect to be raising her grandchildren. It was rewarding work, but it was exhausting work. I learned from her the load that caregivers carry. I also learned how many of them find meaning in their caregiving. 
So those have been my teachers in what I'm going to share with you today. So what does the face of Cleveland look like as we consider older adults and our demographics? So I'm going to share some slides with you today. I, those pictures on the left-hand side are Cleveland seniors. If you didn't grab a book when you came in, their stories are in this book. We feature 17 of them every year when we celebrate Cleveland Senior Day. So I try and include real people in my stories. So also a picture of our, our, our city, our changing city, the refugee farm looking out into the urban city. So what does Cleveland look like? And the data I'm sharing, I'm so grateful, is from our partners at the Center for Community Solutions. Um, so I'm really grateful to be able to share some of their data. In a city of 390,000 people, just under 70,000 of them are older adults. And for my talk today, um, a person that I'm going to define as an older adult is someone 60 years of age and older. The city of Cleveland is divided into 17 wards, and as you can see from this map, um, some of the wards have a higher percentage of seniors, so the darker blue is, the, is, is increasing. The greatest concentration is in Ward 1, the Lee Miles neighborhood, and the center city wards like 3, 15, 14 have smaller concentrations. More than half of Cleveland seniors earn less than $25,000 a year. This considers their Social Security and their retirement income, but it does not include lump sum income such as inheritance or the sale from a house. You might also be interested to know that median rent for a Cleveland senior is $533 a month. To afford this rent, a senior needs to have an income of about $21,400. The average Social Security benefit in Cleveland is $1,466. So there's a gap of about $3,800 between um, the average Social Security amount and the average amount it costs to live um, if you're a renter. You might also find it interesting as I talk about rent that last year in our Cleveland Department of Aging, we worked with 195 individuals who we met because of Cleveland Housing Court and they were being evicted. And so that uh, intersection of people not being able to afford rent. So they were going through Cleveland Municipal Housing Court and we got a referral at the Department of Aging. Uh, related to income, 21.7% of Cleveland seniors live in poverty. The highest concentrations are in Ward 3 and Ward 5. Um, those are the downtown, central, Kinsman, and Fairfax neighborhoods. Unfortunately, poverty is high all over this city. Um, the lowest is 9.2%. We know that Social Security keeps many people out of poverty. Overall, the poverty rate in Cleveland is 35.4%. or 35.4%. This may or may not surprise you, but many Cleveland older adults are still in the workforce or seeking work. And this may be attributed to the overall good health of older adults, the change in Social Security, retirement benefits, the general economic climate right now, perhaps the need for health insurance, or the design of employer-sponsored um, benefits, with, which typically now um, transfer greater responsibility to the retirees. So for many, gone are the days of pensions, and now are the days of 401ks. And how do I meet Cleveland seniors? Well, since 2008, I've been the administrative manager at the Cleveland Department of Aging. And annually, about 5,600 people reach out to our office for one or more of our programs, or someone contacts us on their behalf. It could be police, councilmen, fire, the water department, building and housing that discover a senior in need. So I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what I believe are already some very age-friendly services in the Department of Aging. And I'll just share a few with you in that packet as well as our brochure of the full range of services. So in 2015, through a contract with Senior Transportation Connection, uh, 25,666 trips were provided to City of Cleveland residents. All that the requirement is is that someone be 60 years of age and older and live in the City of Cleveland. 70% of those trips were for medical appointments. 70%. The rest were for personal trips to the store, to the bank, to the library, to the volunteer. A study says that older men outlive their ability to drive by eight years on average and women 10 years. 
We have to find ways to ease that transition, that retirement from driving for all people. While senior transportation connection has been a good start, we know there are more resources needed in this to ease that transition, that retirement from driving. Secondly, around home maintenance, last year 748 people got their grass cut by us. Unfortunately, that's not even near the number of people that applied for the program. Things like grass cutting, snow shoveling, leaf raking, basic needs of homeowners everywhere. 64% of Cleveland senior households live in a home they own. In our focus groups and research, only about half of Cleveland older adults indicate that they're able to maintain the outside of their home. Focus group participants share that their concerns are around falling outside, their concerns are around safety, especially as it comes to snow removal. Um, approximately 36% of the folks in our focus group share that they're not just concerned about falls outside, but also inside their home and home maintenance tasks. Some people have friends or family who help them, but other older adults shared with us that hiring people with maintenance can be both expensive, but it's also difficult to know who to trust. So related to these home maintenance issues, I'll just share with you a new phenomenon. Last year, we treated 80 homeowners for bed bug extermination. It's another home maintenance issue. Um, a Cleveland Care Calls last year, we made 54,500 phone calls to seniors who requested the survey, we, or the service that uses a reverse 911 program that checks on the well-being of seniors. More than one third of Cleveland seniors live alone. Under home repairs, often the only thing older than the person we're serving is the home they're living in, right? And so how do we help people apply for programs and uh, benefit from programs that could help them maintain their home? Hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds of people applied for help with roof repairs, major plumbing, major electrical, tree repairs. And these are only the programs we provide. There's so many resources we try and connect people to in the community around fixing a furnace, a hot water tank. In 2015, 2,314 people were served by one or more of the services of our Aging and Disability Resource Center. So our name, the Department of Aging, is a bit of a misnomer these days. We also serve people 18 to 59 years old. Um, and so that's a snapshot of some of the services of the Department of Aging now that I think are age-friendly. And then I want to share with you sort of where we see ourselves going and the input we need from each of you and from the community. So that's the local lens, but I'm going to take us uh, global. And I actually, I feel like Dr. Hackenstead should be up here doing this part of the talk, but I will hope I, uh, I learned well. So our global pictures, it's, it, it's not just Cleveland that's aging. Uh, populations around the world are rapidly aging, and we know that's related to fertility rates that have fallen to low levels in most world regions and people living longer. We also know that the elderly population itself is also growing older. So the oldest old, the 80 and, uh, and above, is the fastest growing group among the elderly. Today, living to 70 or 80 is no longer a rarity in many parts of the world. It's projected by the UN that by 2015, the number of older persons will exceed the number of young for the first time in history. The UN says it's unprecedented, pervasive around the world, enduring. We won't go back to the days um, before, and it has profound implications. Increased longevity has led to new challenges and questions. How many years can older people expect to live in good health? What are the chronic diseases they might have to deal with? How long can they live independently? How many of them are still working? Will they have sufficient resources to last their lifetime? Can they afford health care costs? The world is facing these and many more, many more questions as population aging continues. In addition to ch questions and challenges, we know there are also so many opportunities. We know the incredible resource older adults are for their families, for their community, for the formal workplace, or for the informal workforce. The repository of knowledge in our community. They often can help us avoid making the same mistakes again. So as I mentioned, 15 years ago, I began here in graduate school, and this was all predicted, right? This was going to happen all of a sudden. And we kept hearing the word silver tsunami. And I must say, I, that word sounds scary to me. 
right? It sounds like it's just, it's gonna, it's gonna kill us, right? We, we might, and so I actually prefer the word silver surge, right? It talks of the volume, but it feels more powerful the negative to me. So I know that tsunami is catchy, but I think it's another form of ageism that is really pervasive in our um, society. So beginning in 2011, we know that the oldest members of the baby boom generation, those uh, defined as being born between 1946 and 1964, celebrated their 65th birthday. And on that day, today, and every day until 2030, 10,000 baby boomers will turn 65 wherever they live in this country, whether they live in Cleveland, Ohio, Cleveland, Tennessee, or Cleveland, Utah. This is a huge demographic, economic, and social shift, and something the world hasn't seen. Uh, this surge has been building and gaining momentum. According to uh, US Census projections, it will peak in 2025 with 4.2 million new people 65 years and older. I know there are real concerns about whether our health and caregiving system is prepared um, for this surge. And today we are even close to the tipping point. Scripps Institute of Gerontology put out its population projections for 2015 and 2030 for the state of Ohio. And it's projected in 2020 that Cuyahoga, in Cuyahoga County, there will be more people over the age of 60 in 2020 than under the age of 20. So more older people than younger people just four years from now. I believe all of this that I've shared were some of the factors at play when my director, Jane Fumick, heard Dr. Hockenstead talk about the World Health Organization's age-friendly cities. Jane knew about the surge building. She knew the needs of Cleveland seniors. She knew the faces of current residents. And so when she heard Dr. Hockenstead share about the World Health Organization's age-friendly city at a COOP meeting. I wasn't there, but as she tells it to me, she heard him speaking and she said, I gotta jump on this. I gotta jump on this. She wanted to take leadership in it, but she also knew because of the needs of Cleveland residents related to income, we needed to assume leadership on this. It, she thought this might be a way we could significantly address some of the needs of older Cleveland residents. A little bit about the World Health Organization's global network of age-friendly cities. The idea as I've read about it was conceived back in 2005 at the opening session of the World Congress of Gerontology in Brazil. So we're about 10, 11 years into it. The question was, how can we make our world more age-friendly? Since 2008, the majority of the world's population lives in cities. Urban populations continue to grow and it's estimated that by 2030, three out of five people in our world will live in an urban sitting, setting. So while this urbanization is happening, also residents are growing older. And so out of this convergence came this global movement of cities striving to better meet the needs of older residents. Communities that would foster health, foster actor in fact, foster active aging, foster the well-being of older adults. I love this from the World Health Organization. An age-friendly world enables people of all ages to actively participate in community activities and treats everyone with respect, regardless of their age. It's a place that makes it easy to help for older people to stay connected to people that are important to them. And it helps people stay healthy and active, even at the oldest ages, and provides appropriate support to those who can no longer look after them. So the World Health Organization requires each community to look at these eight domains on the screen that you're seeing. So Cleveland undertook this process of looking at each of these domains and, and um, finding ways to make Cleveland more age friendly. So for example, in civic engagement and um, employment, the World Health Organization talks about options of volunteering, employment op options, post-retirement training, in communication and information, the need for oral communication, printed information, plain language, access to computers and the internet, broad access. Under housing, it was looking at affordability, design, modifications, housing options. 
under outdoor spaces and buildings, asking cities to look at their roads, their buildings, their public toilets, their green space. Under social participation, the accessibility of events, affordability, awareness of events, addressing isolation. Under community support and health services, the accessibility of services, coordinated service delivery, under respect and, in self and social inclusion, looking at the public images of aging, respectful and inclusive services, and under transportation affordability, priority seating, looking at parking. Those are just a few that jumped out at me. So when a city agrees to go through the aid to become an age-friendly city through the World Health Organization. It's not just an idea, it's hard work. And this is the process, our three to five year process. So Mayor Frank Jackson signed in November 2014 and committed the city of Cleveland to a multi-year process for assessing Cleveland's age-friendliness. And out of that, also coming up with a three-year action plan. In December of that year, we were accepted into the World Health Organization's global network of age-friendly cities. I think we were something like 282 of the cities when we joined, so we had many people ahead to learn from, but we were the first in Ohio. The following April, Cleveland joined the AARP network of age-friendly cities. An age-friendly council was formed with 35 members. This is a combination of both professionals in the field of aging and professionals that represent some of those domain groups, such as um, uh, community, uh, the community parks, like the Metro Parks is part of it, or Cuyahoga Arts and Council are also on it. The council meets six times a year, as you won't be surprised to learn, Dr. Hockenstead chairs that council. There's also an advise, an executive committee made up of seven members in leadership here within the city of Cleveland in um, agencies such as the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging, Benjamin Rose, Fairhill Partners, and the city. I really stand here today as someone who's had a front seat to this project, sort of gonna give you my social work lens. The hard work has really been done by my director, Jane Fumick, my colleague, Emily Matillo, the research team at the Center for Community Solutions, our colleagues at AARP Ohio, we had a um, Encore employee through Mature Services in the Cleveland Foundation who assisted us with some focus groups. Um, and uh, we had two MSAS students, one is in the room today, Erica, who assisted us with um, so many focus groups. And the foundation support came by way of the Cleveland Foundation, uh, Mount Sinai, and McGregor, and for that we're really grateful. So we recently moved out of the assessment phase and we are moving into the planning phase. And I wanted, because we've just come out of the assessment phase, I wanna give you some information from that assessment phase and then tell you where we're going with planning. So we wanted to solicit the feedback of Cleveland residents who are 60 years of age and older, and we did this through four steps of the assessment. This was really what I would call the listening tour. Right? We wanted to take it out into the community. Um, first, the Center for Community Solutions looked at external data sources, things like the census data and 211 and resources here at the university. We then did a, um, a comprehensive random survey mailed to 1,000 older adults in the city of Cleveland. The closest we could come for a mailing list was the voter registration records. So if there's just under 70,000, the closest we could get was 55,000, um, that list, and uh, 1,000 of those were mailed. Um, we got 283 surveys back, and um, this number allowed us to consider these results significant from which the Center for Community Solutions could generalize. We did offer anyone who was interested in it, if they filled out the survey, an opportunity to get an emergency preparedness kit that we would deliver to their home. This is a campaign we had been doing in the Department of Aging. This kit had things like first aid supplies, a, a, a battery operated radio in it. So as a, as a thank you gift, and more than 230 people um, did sign up for that. So the survey was anonymous and then they sent in a request for that and separate staff delivered those to their home the following month. 
And then we did a non-random survey. This was a mini survey um, conducted at our senior day event where more than 2,000 older adults attend. We also had uh, more than 1,000 people complete a briefer survey um, that was available in paper form and also available online. So we promoted it through our social media, et cetera. The um, factors they considered the Center for Community Solutions was your zip code and your age. So most people qualified, but they pulled out any of those that um, didn't meet that criteria. And then we did 22 focus groups this fall throughout the community at places like libraries, senior buildings, and senior centers. 350 older adults participated in these focus groups. My colleague Emily worked with city planning to determine where those focus groups could be held so there was one in every neighborhood in the city. I had the good fortune to attend several of those focus groups, and Erica, I think, attended every single one of them and was a note taker and scribe for those and facilitated some at the end. I asked the MSAS interns this year for some feedback from that because I didn't go to every one, and um, some of their comments were, um, Cleveland seniors really value their opinions being heard um, regarding the age friendliness of Cleveland how important it was to remain neutral throughout the focus groups so the facilitator could gain the most honest and accurate information. Uh, one intern noted that older adults tend to be observant and notice problems and strengths that many younger populations may not notice. And they also were considering that their feedback may be able to help other generations. So adding more park benches to the park would also help mothers who were there with their young children. Or adding more um, uh, buttons, um, handicap accessible doors would also be helpful for people that were um, carrying heavy loads. So the older adults mentioned both their needs for them, but also for um, other members of the community. Um, Another comment was that perceptions of aging can be based on negative stereotypes that lead to older adults feeling isolated and powerless. However, when given the opportunity, many seniors will take the initiative and get involved. So as I said, more than 1,000 seniors were heard in this process. The full report, which is 160 pages, is on our website. The summary report, which is 20 pages, is also on our webpage in your um, packet is the two-page version, which I thought might give you a little appetizer of some highlights of it. So you might also be interested to know that participants in the two-hour focus groups were provided with a $25 gift card to Dave's um, supermarket. So what makes a community successful? One important measure is how well it meets the citizens at all states of their life. Is it safe? Is it affordable, healthy, inclusive? Is it a great place to grow up and to grow old? I love what Kofi Annan said, the former United Nations Secretary General, in ushering in the International Year of the Older Person in 1998. He said, a society for all ages is multi-generational. It is not fragmented with youths, adults, and older persons going their separate ways. Rather, it is age-inclusive, with different generations recognizing and acting upon their community of interest. We were really pleased to find that overall, 49% of older adults said the city of Cleveland is excellent or good as a place to live as they age. We know this is not the work just of the Cleveland Department of Aging. This is really the collective work of the community. It's of the Aging Network. It's of the um, work of COOP. It's of our faith-based organizations. It's of all of us and our entire community. Um, so this is the highlight of the overall summary. As I mentioned, there are eight domains, and we really could go well into the evening talking in depth, depth about each of those. So my hope today is really to take a deeper dive into one that particularly interests me. But I hope you will take some time and read the report and think about its implications for your work, for your neighborhood. A few teasers from that report. Three out of five people believe there are negative stereotypes about older people in our community. Another comment, while there are 150 plus parks in Cleveland, 51% say there is often nowhere to sit and rest. 53% of people have access to internet. However, internet access decreases for lower income seniors. 
So those are a few um, snippets from each of the domains. I'm going to focus on transportation for several reasons. One, we know that access to transportation is necessary to age in place. We know that depending on the health, the age, mobility, travel needs vary considerably among our older adult populations. Some people are interested and able to drive well into their 70s, and others need to rely on public transportation in their 60s. We also know that Cleveland is a very car-dependent city. I shared with you last year that we provided 25,000, more than 25,000 trips. Um, so each day in my professional work, I hear from people who are retired from driving. So this one particularly interests me. And as we look at these pictures, while they speak about different modes of transportation around our city, they also speak to me as a social worker about independence, engagement, social connection, physical wellness. So the World Health Organization really sets up a framework for cities around the world to look at and ask questions about your um, in each of these domains. So this is what the World Health Organization asks each city to consider around transportation. You know, are public transportation costs consistent, clearly displayed? Are they affordable? Is public transportation reliable? Is it frequent? Is it available on weekends and in the evenings? Are there well-marked routes and vehicles? Are there good connections? Um, are, is there specialized transportation available for people with disabilities? Are the stops and stations well lit? Do they have adequate seating and shelter? Is a voluntary transport system available when public transport is too limited? Are roads well maintained? Are traffic signs visible and well placed? Our driver refresher courses, are, avail are they available? So all around the world, if you choose to go through this process, this is the framework you're working from. So in looking at Cleveland and considering these factors, this was one of the sample survey questions. What's your usual way of running errands? So this was the full survey that was mailed to 1,000 people with uh, 283 responses. So this is one question around transportation. A second question is, what problems do you face? We wanted to inquire about the cost, safety, ease of use of public transportation. We wanted to inquire about road conditions, around parking challenges. We also inquired in the survey about access to things such as easy to read traffic signs, audio visual pedestrian crosswalks, enforced speed limits. In the focus group, we did not use those questions. We used more prompts, and these were the prompt questions in the focus group, some sample prompts. And the results of the survey around transportation was that 68% of Cleveland seniors still drive themselves, 28% being re report being driven by family or friends, 14% take public transportation, 12% walk, 11% use senior transportation services of any kind. So people obviously were given the opportunity, as many of us, to note more than one way that they um, get around. I meet older adults every day who use our transportation services either because of a current health need, but they don't plan to use it forever, or they use it because of weather, or they use it because of um, the distance or the parking at the place they're going. So it may be they use senior transportation services for certain things, but not always. We found that there were differences in travel across incomes, and you would find this in the summary. For those with incomes of $25,000 annually or less, 37% were driven by friends and family, and 21% of those people utilized public transportation. For those with incomes reported above $65,000 a year, everyone that reported back to us reported driving as their usual mode of transportation, and less than 7% regularly use public transportation. These are some of the examples of the infographics we're using to help get this information out into the community around, um, you know, how do Cleveland older adults 
get where they need to go. Other findings, really positively, most older adults in Cleveland report having no or few difficulties getting around. And we know this really speaks to, we think, the community impact of services like Senior Transportation Connection, um, our strong community network, um, RTA. I think it also leads us down thinking about the current state of RTA and its funding and the federal funding around uh, public transportation. Um, many older adults who are still driving do report that road conditions can be an obstacle. Many Cleveland seniors walk. Um, many reported they lack access to beeping crosswalks and that fears um, around safety are prevalent. Um, many older adults also report having access to, to um, convenient public transportation, but scheduling difficulties present challenges when using senior transportation services. Um, some of the other considerations um, that I just wanted to, to highlight as a social worker that were curious for me in um, taking part of this was just the impact of safe sidewalks. We heard from people about sidewalks not being shoveled in the winter. We heard about raised sidewalks from tree roots. We heard about, about um, ice, and salt not being put down. We heard often in focus groups around safety on public transportation. We heard seniors talk about they really limit their riding after rush hour and before children get out of school. So their window of movement is like 9.30 to 2, right? That's when they felt safest on the bus. Um, we heard from seniors that they weren't always sure of the rules of the road around bike lanes. And they, one of the things that came out of the focus group was an interest in having a, a refresher course on how to share the road with bikes and what was expected of them. We know that many of the people that were in our focus group learned to drive 50 years ago when our roads didn't exactly look like they look now. It seems like every week there's a new road with a bike lane in it and just not sure how much space to give or whether they could drive in those lanes. So they came up with a solution themselves around um, having some driver refreshes refresher courses. We also heard from older adults about, you know, that without having access to smartphones in the current state that it was very difficult to access newer transportation options like Uber and Lyft and also some concerns about their safety with it. Um, we also learned in the survey um, overall around communication that many people lacked information about services currently available. So a service that I know well, Senior Transportation Connection, may not be as well known out in the community. And so how we as a community are continuing to get information out, that may limit their participation because they just don't know about it. I think each of us probably in this room knows the impact of lack of transportation and its impact on health and access to health care providers, employment opportunities, civic engagement opportunities. I added this slide because I just continue to be interested and curious about how our senses are impacted by aging and implications. Perhaps I see this most clearly as my parents are continually searching for the right glasses that will help them drive at night. This is like the eternal search for them. And we know that the sense most needed for driving is vision, and we, we know it's also normal that um, there are changes in our eyes as we age. We know not everyone experiences the same symptoms, but there are some common um, vision changes. So then how do signs appear when you in indicate one a person with cataracts, with um, the glare from the headlights at night? What supports are available in the, in the third vision uh, related to glaucoma? So I continue to be curious about this and the implications for our societies we look as at an age-friendly um, community. I said there are eight domains. I only shared a little bit about one today because I believe transportation is connected to each of the other seven domains housing, being able to use public spaces, being able to fully participate in the community. Cleveland older adults, we heard in the report, and while we've known this um, around our country, um, we, we found it even to be higher in this report that nearly 80% of Cleveland older adults indicate that it was very important to be able to remain in their home as they age. And we know that access to transportation is one key factor for allowing people 
to age in place. But I also think it's a critical factor in the idea of aging in community, being engaged in life outside their home. We learned from the transportation or from the survey that transportation and cost are two of the biggest barriers for people in participating in the social, cultural, and recreational um, uh, offerings in our community. One focus group participant said, our life doesn't end at 4.30 when the bus ends. Interestingly, in the survey, we also found that $15 was the amount several groups gave as the price point for participating in these cultural, recreational um, gems in our community. So as we think about how do we make Cleveland more age-friendly. So what's next? On Tuesday, 150 people will gather at Benjamin Rose for the first Age-Friendly Cleveland Summit. And we're really excited about this. This was an invited group of people that we think can help us move from the findings of the assessment to some real strategies. Um, and from those, we're gonna, we hope to leave on Tuesday with 32 strategies, four from each of the eight domains. We will then take that draft of strategies back out into the community and focus groups will once again happen with older adults. The uh, priority will, the process will begin, I believe December 1st is when the plan needs to be submitted um, to the World Health Organization about how Cleveland intends to, to move forward with this. And at that point then um, we'll identify some lead agencies and funders and um, so we are moving from assessment into planning um, as we speak. I wanted to end my talk, I, sh I opened by sharing some of the faces of the people who helped shape me. I, I just wanna give words to uh, a, a woman who um, contributed to the ASA Generations uh, book that I just wanna end with this. Um, so her name is Anne Leach. <clears throat> she resides in San Francisco and she says, though I won't be able to attend the Creating Age-Friendly Communities Conference, as a 75-year-old, I have some very strong opinions as a result of being your target population that I hope you will ponder and bring forward in your conference. I live in a gated senior community with all the amenities one could dream of, workshops and handicrafts, exercise, you name it, we have it. And yet I am longing, longing to walk to the corner coffee shop, to hear the sound of children playing, dogs barking. I want to eat at the corner cafe, see young people in love, walk to the library, catch the BART into the city, watch mothers with their children in the park, young families, and teenies in their latest wild outfits. Yes, I'm lucky to have what I do, and I never forget that, but I am excluded from the mainstream of life. Please consider in your conversations that there are many of us who do not want to be maintained and monitored. We want to belong not only to each other, with whom we may only have one other common denominator, age, but to society in general. We just want, we want to be just like everyone else. So if you are interested in staying connected to what's happening in Age-Friendly Cleveland, my colleague Emily is um, really the champion in our office of it. Her number is here in her email. The summary and full report is at our website. If you haven't followed us on Facebook and Twitter, do so today because everything that's happening on Tuesday, you'll see it all on social media. And then my information below as well. So thank you for your interest in this topic. Any questions? Oh. Thank you, Mary, so much for all this exciting information. And I, I want to make a comment on how well the presentations went together in emphasizing the positive strength-based approaches in aging. And it's just really refreshing to be a part of it. And thank you both for your talk and your speech today. Yeah, I agree. Okay, terrific. Great. Oh, yes. 
Mary, how is Cleveland working with the surrounding suburbs, the governments around us? Because, uh, you know, many of these same problems are in the neighboring towns and, and suburbs. So what is the connection between Cleveland and the suburbs here, if any? Yeah, that, that's a great question. We get that often. And um, this is very focused on the city of Cleveland. This is, um, but I think what's happened is there's a lot of interest and energy around this now. And I, um, we know that Columbus has recently gone through the AARP um, age friendly. They're beginning that prospect. So we hope it builds momentum. Um, as I said, we are focused on Cleveland, but I think some of the findings um, may make people look at their communities differently. So I would say, stay tuned for that, right? The surge is here. <laughs> um, I will just end, I shared with, um, uh, I was so pleased to go to my nephew's, um, see on my nephew's fridge the other day, his 100 year old bucket list picture. And this is his self portrait, he crinkled it. So it looks like some wrinkles. He's in second grade. And I noted his big smile. Right? So what he thought he would look like at 100 years old, and what he writes is that when he's 100 years old, he would like to play all the games he wants. And what he has um, pictured here is himself playing the Wii in a wheelchair, right? And for me, the other comment that he wrote was that he just really wants to be able to eat all the ice cream he wants. <laughs> And I think Ann Leach is saying the same thing here, right? That yeah. they want to live in our communities and not um, be maintained. So thank you. Thank you very much. This has been just a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Charles and Mary. We have a little special something for you from the school. And it adds such richness to have our alumni come back. And thank you to all of you for being here. And I'd like to invite you outside. We have some snacks and the conversation can continue. Thank you so much. <laughs>